Hello there, you're watching the press preview. A first look at what is on the front pages as they arrive. And in the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with The Telegraph's chief political correspondent, Camilla Turner, and the political journalist, Shaista Aziz. Thank you both very much for joining us this evening. Uh, so let's see what is on some of those front pages. And the Metro leads with death of our hero. They report the death of Jordan Gatley, a former British soldier killed while fighting on the front line in Ukraine. Rwanda flights may not get off the ground is a headline on the eye as the Court of Appeal is to consider the government's new migrant policy. While the Daily Mail story summarises the same story with the words new Rwanda flight farce. The Financial Times reports that the Conservatives have criticised Boris Johnson's attempt to rip up the Northern Ireland trade deal. Whilst The Guardian also leads on the Northern Ireland Agreement, carrying a warning from the Confederation of British Industry. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code that you see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while you watch us. Well, let's get the views of Camilla Turner and Shaista Aziz. Welcome to you both. Um, Camilla, sh shall we start with you? Um, the Metro, uh, you guys have, have, have gone with the story about Jordan Gatley uh, as, as the lead story. Um, the Metro have called it death of our hero. That was what his dad called him, wasn't it? Yes, that's correct. This is quoting from um, uh, the Jordan's family tribute that they paid him in a Facebook post where they announced that their son Jordan, just aged 24, um, has been killed fighting um, in the front line in Ukraine. Um, his family praise him. They say he's, he's a hero. They talk about how he, he, he loved what he did. He went out to Ukraine and they say he wasn't um, only there in his capacity as a soldier, but he was also training Ukrainian troops. So they say he made a huge difference doing the thing he loved doing. Um, now, this is, of course, the second um, British soldier who's been killed fighting in action um, in Ukraine. Um, the Ukrainian president has um, called on international fighters to come and join them in, a, in an international legion and help them defeat President Putin's invasion. Um, but we have the head of the British army in the UK urging uh, people not to go out and fight and saying that it's much better to help the Ukrainians in other ways. Um, of course, what we have here is this very tragic situation of a, of a soldier who's defied that call from the head of the British Army, gone out to fight and sadly lost his life in doing so. And, um, Shasta, do you think that, that more should be done to stop uh, British people going out to fight or, or do you think that that's now an impossible? Well, obviously, my heart goes out to this uh, man's family. You know, to lose your son at any age, but the age of 24 is clearly very devastating. And I hope that his body can return home and he can have the funeral that his family want him to have. Um, as Camilla said, this is the second British uh, man to die in Ukraine. We also know there are two British nationals who have been sentenced to death in a, in a Russian court uh, for being involved in fighting alongside uh, Ukrainians, uh, alongside uh, Moroccan as well. So I think really serious questions questions need to be asked about why British men are travelling to Ukraine, how are they travelling to Ukraine to go and fight over there in, in, a, in a war, which a lot of people obviously feel very anguished about. We know there's a great deal of empathy for Ukrainians, as there should be, but we still have to ask these questions. What are they doing over there? Uh, the British Army themselves have said they don't want former British um, soldiers travelling to Ukraine. Uh, there's prospects of anyone going over there who returns to the country, returns to the UK, facing potential terrorism charges. So I think it's only right and proper that, it's, that there's a degree of scrutiny that is applied to this story in relation to how and why this man ended up there and who else is planning to go out there and what, what is the motivation that is, uh, that is leading to this. And, of course, Camilla, um, people from other countries have fought in foreign wars since time immemorial. You know, we, we've always had mercenaries. But, but Camilla, are, are you concerned that, that the Britons who are going out there are at greater risk than the Ukrainians, especially when you look at what's happened in Donetsk and these two Britons getting the death penalty. Yes, that is very true that these British people, particularly in the case of those who are awaiting trial in, in this Russian back court, court and quite possibly also um, face, um, face death, um, what this presents is an opportunity for the Russians to use it as a propaganda tool um, if they're able to capture these soldiers um, and kind of use it as almost a show to say to other um, countries, other individuals thinking of going to, to 
joined the Ukrainian forces, um, it really just sends a message to say, well, if you do fall into enemy hands, then you you risk being killed um, and, you know, potentially tortured or who knows what might happen. So this does... Um, it does offer a very powerful propaganda tool to the Russians. Um, and I think it would be in their interest to try and put off international fighters from coming to join the Ukrainian defence forces because it offers, of course, more, more people going to fight, but also potentially a morale boost for the Ukrainians to know that other um, fighters in, in, in other countries are, are also willing to risk their lives to come and join them. Let's move on to your second story that you've chosen tonight, uh, and this is about the uh, flights to Rwanda that the government wants to put some asylum seekers on, and there has, of course, been a legal battle to try and stop this happening. The Daily Mail uh, have gone with the headline, New Rwanda Flight Farce, uh, and the I newspaper has gone for Rwanda Flights May Not Get Off the Ground. So it's a slightly different tone from both of them, but, um, Shaysta... Do you think this can be stopped? Uh, you know, it, it does seem that the legal process is, is, is getting close to the wire, given that tomorrow will just be a day before these flights are due to leave. Well, I think, firstly, we never should have got into this situation in the first place. I think this policy is deeply problematic and flawed. And I think it's very likely that, you know, as, as the newspapers are reporting, that these flights won't take off. But just to say, I, I don't think they should take off. I didn't think there needs to be proper scrutiny, legal scrutiny in relation to these flights in relation to the breaking of international law and conventions on refugees' rights. And also, uh, there needs to be further scrutiny on what will happen to people when they get to Rwanda. In particular, I'm very concerned about, uh, you know, reporting around child refugees, for example. There's been reports in the Sunday newspapers that potentially children could also be deported or minors. And this whole thing, it, it, it is a fiasco, but not for the reasons that the Daily Mail is reporting. It's a fiasco because it basically brings Britain into disrepute in relation to human rights and refugee conventions and, and, and the law. And I think it's really shocking that this is going on at this time. And really what we need to see is empathy. We need to see that the law respected by the government. You know, this first story we've focused on this evening is Ukraine. We know there are plenty of people fleeing for their lives, uh, you know, trying to leave Ukraine. Uh, we know that refugees are increasing around the world. And we have to find a way to create a humane, immigration and refugee uh, you know, uh, system in this country that is uh, aligned with the law and aligned with decency and human rights. And, and Camilla, the, the government, of course, will argue that these are people who shouldn't be in this country and that they have every right to deport them. Yes, that's exactly right. The government argument hinges on the fact that they are really wanting to create a deterrent effect for um Asylum seekers who come to the UK, they call it illegally. These are people coming on small boat crossings across the channel um, in the hope of seeking asylum in the UK. UK, but are risking their lives um, in, in doing so. And it's interesting what we've got on tomorrow's front page is both the male and the eye concentrate on the legal challenges that are being mounted um, that could very well ground this flight that's due to take off on Monday. But actually, there are two separate legal challenges that each front page is talking about. So on the one hand, um, we've got the male talking about how these 31 individuals who are due to be on this flight tomorrow um, each one of them could potentially have their own legal challenge um, mounted against, the, against that flight taking off. Um, so human rights lawyers acting for every single one of those people, um, they're saying the Home Office are being hit by a deluge of, of legal claims, um, which could, for each of those individuals, get them off that plane. And then separately, we've got the I talking about um, this overall legal challenge, um, which was already, which, which is against the entire flight taking off. It's, it's a legal challenge against the, yeah. the policy to send people to Rwanda. OK, yeah, uh, we're going to pause there. Just... Sorry, sorry Chester, we're, we're just out of time on this for this section. Uh, so we're just going to pause, but we'll be getting lots more of your thoughts on that in the 11.30. Uh, but coming up, Conservatives attack the Prime Minister over his attempt to remove the Northern Ireland trade deal. Welcome back. You're watching the press preview. Uh, we've been now the Telegraph's chief political correspondent, Camilla Turner, and the political journalist, Sher Easter Aziz. Uh, 
what's happening in Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, and what the government is going to be trying to do in uh, the courts from today, tomorrow, also in the Financial Times in the front of The Guardian. Uh, Shay Ister, what the government is trying to do tomorrow, do you think it is legal in international law? No, I don't. Well, I, I don't think it is. I mean, we, I'm looking at the details on the front pages. Legislation hasn't landed yet, but it, it, from the pre-briefing in the papers, it doesn't look particularly good. Um, it looks like the UK is planning to unilaterally override the Northern Ireland Protocol, which obviously is a breach of international law, and it puts the Good Friday Agreement in jeopardy. And furthermore, it's also, um, you know, th this was one of Boris Johnson's um, pledges on which he won a mandate in the 2019 election. So this is a very serious situation, and it never should have come to this again. I've already said that once this evening, but it shouldn't have come to this. And, um, you know, for me, this really illustrates, again, a very cavalier approach, uh, not only from the Prime Minister, but from this government to international law and to this uh, crisis, because I think that's what it is. And this has been going on for a long, long time. It's been rambling on and on. And now the government is saying, you just need to trust us. And it's saying that potentially it's saying that it doesn't want to uh, publish the full legal advice that it's received. I think it needs to publish the full legal advice. And I think there needs to be full transparency and accountability on this. And parliamentary scrutiny needs to be applied to this as well. Camilla, the, the problem for the government is that, that they could, through doing this, alienate Europe further and also simply make the situation in Northern Ireland worse rather than better. Yes, exactly. That's completely right. This is, you know, a difficult position for the government, both within Northern Ireland, but also um, how the UK government plays this has a far broader bearing than just within legal I, I, just within Northern Ireland. Sorry, uh, we've got the, the Financial Times lists the kind of coalition of critics that are ready to to come out against this legislation once it drops. We've got um, the government's own um, opposition within its own party for a start. Tory MPs who who don't like the sound of what this legislation is going to contain. We've got members of the Lords, um, EU figures, figures in Washington, and also figures within Northern Ireland. So this is a huge amount of different groups that. Potentially Potentially, um, the government's on a collision course if once it published its legislation, um, these, these different groups don't like what they see. Indeed. Uh, we've only got 30 seconds left, but Chase, so very quickly, um, also on the front of the Financial Times, the new McDonald's in Moscow, well, it's not McDonald's, is it? It's their Russian alternative. Has, has it got your mouth watering? Not really. I think this is really a propaganda tool by the Russian state to say, you know, you, you want to slap sanctions on us, we'll be fine, we can sort out our own burgers. Uh, and, and Camilla, apparently they don't do McFlurries, which, which is a big minus in, in, my, in my household. <laughs> yes, that's correct. This is going to be not exactly just McDonald's as we know it. It's going to be the Russian take on McDonald's. So the menus will be slightly dif different. Um, and as you say, if it doesn't involve McFlurries, then <laughs> it may be that it drastically declines in popularity.